It's not often that you find a system that can replace an entire home lab, especially one that doesn't cost a fortune or take up more space than a toaster. But this device might just be that solution, with impressive performance, reasonable options for expansion, and no reliance on proprietary software, it checks a lot of boxes. But is there a catch? Well, let's take a closer look and find out. This is the WTR Pro from AUSTAR. Ow star? A U star? I don't know. You let me know your favorite pronunciation down in the comments. I'm not entirely sure how to say it, but I am sure that I like what they're doing. My inbox is constantly flooded with brands pushing generic mini PCs, and they just all look the same. And in many cases, they are the same, just rebranded. But AU star actually seems to be doing something a bit different, at least with their NAS lineup. Now you might remember, or maybe not since the video didn't do super well, but I looked at the AUSTAR R1 and really liked what it had to offer. It was a solid option for a lightweight home server, or even a home theater PC that could double as a home server. It seemed like the perfect option for someone looking for a simple solution for running a simple Plex server or something without buying into something like Synology. The WTR Pro feels like an evolution of the R1, offering more features while still being reasonably priced. And one of the best things about both of these systems is that neither of them come with some lousy proprietary NAS software. They're sold with the idea that you can install whatever third-party operating system you want. So maybe if you're using this at home, you could install something like Unraid. Or if you're using this for a small business or something, you could set up something like TrueNAS. Now, speaking of business software, if you work in IT or run a business yourself, you should definitely check out Odoo, the sponsor of today's video. Odoo is an all-in-one business management software designed to streamline every aspect of your company's operation. Whether it's CRM, accounting, sales, or inventory management, Odoo brings everything together in one single easy-to-use platform. One of the best parts about Odoo is its flexibility. You can pick and choose the apps your business needs without getting overwhelmed by unnecessary features. The entire system is intuitive and customizable, so you can easily adapt it to the way your business works. Also, if your business produces any types of goods, odds are you want an organized, efficient operation that makes it easy to stay on top of things. Odoo's manufacturing tools allow you to efficiently plan production, schedule tasks, and track inventory in real time, all from one place. If you're curious to see how Odoo can help your business, you can try it out for free for 15 days, no credit card required. Plus, you can use any single app from Odoo for free for life. So click the link down in the description to start simplifying and optimizing your business with Odoo today. Now, before I dive too deep into things, I want to be clear that AUSTAR didn't sponsor this video or compensate me in any way. They did send the system over for me to check out, but I can say whatever I want about it. And if you've seen some of my coverage of other similar systems, you'll know I don't have issues when it comes to being critical. At first glance, the WTR Pro looks pretty similar to other 4-bay NAS systems from Ugreen or Terramaster, but you'll quickly notice that it's a bit unique. That's because the I.O. is actually on the side. Or I guess, maybe the I.O.'s on the back and then the drives are on the side. Or maybe the I.O. This might seem a bit odd, and I know a lot of people might not like it at first, but depending on how you could have this NAS situated, it could be beneficial for having easier access to the I.O. I know it definitely made testing easier for me. On the front or side or whatever this side is, there are four swappable two and a half inch or three and a half inch drive bays. And yes, I said swappable, not hot swappable, because according to the website, these do not support hot swap. Now for a home user, that's probably not a deal breaker, but definitely still a bummer. There's also a power button and LED, which can be covered with this neat little thingy here. Now, I think it's there to accidentally prevent hitting the button, which makes sense, but it could also be helpful just for blocking out the LED light. On this other side, there are two USB 2 ports, two USB 3 ports, HDMI and display ports, as well as a TF card reader. There's also a USB-C port, which AUSTAR's website doesn't seem to indicate any sort of bandwidth for, but I later found out that it's just USB 3.0 or 5 gigabit per second. The website does list this as a full-featured USB-C port, which when I looked up what that meant, it seems that you could potentially power this entire system over USB-C, which I guess we'll have to find out if that's actually the case. Regardless, you can power the WTR Pro by plugging in the included 120 watt power supply into the DC jack here. Next to that, the system also has two Intel i226V 2.5 gig NICs. Sadly, no 10 gig. On the next side, there's just a 120mm intake fan for the drive cage. 
Then on the bottom, yeah, that's, that's for sure the bottom. On the bottom, there's a small removable plate that covers up some more goodies. My version of the WTR Pro came with two 8GB sticks of DDR4 3200 SOTA memory, as well as a 512GB NVMe SSD. There's also room for another 2280 NVMe SSD, as well as a Wi-Fi card or other M.2 E key card. And that's pretty much all there is, at least on the outside. I like to have fun though, so I started cracking this thing open to get a look inside. Getting it disassembled was pretty easy. You just remove two screws on the fan cover and then pull it out. Behind that, there's four more screws holding the main assembly into the aluminum chassis. With those removed, you can slide the whole thing. Nope, no you can't. That's because the daughter board for the power button gets caught on the guide rails of the case. So to remove that, you have to awkwardly get a Phillips screwdriver in there. With that off though, the entire motherboard and drive cage assembly comes out with no problem. It's a little bit of a pain, but I quickly found out that there's really no reason to do this other than, well, maybe to change the thermal paste at some point. Oh yeah, speaking of thermal paste, there's probably some of that stuff squished between the CPU cooler and the Ryzen 7 5825U, an 8-core, 16-thread Zen 3 mobile CPU, which should provide plenty of horsepower for whatever you might want to do with this system. But like I said, there really isn't anything on this board that you can't get to from the little access hatch on the bottom, unlike some other systems I've looked at. <coughs> you agree. I know many of you guys ask with setups like this if the PCIe slot or PCIe connectors on the back plane could be repurposed. But seeing as there wasn't a SATA controller or anything on the back plane, I would imagine these two PCIe connectors are just being used to carry SATA signals. In fact, the only components I noticed on the back plane seem to be for the system fan. Oddly, there was what appeared to be a thermal probe attached to what was labeled as the second system fan. I'm not sure if that's just old silk screening from a different version of this board or what. For such a compact package, the WTR Pro packs in a decent amount of features, but how much will it cost you? Well, surprisingly, not that much. The version I'm using with the 16 gigs of RAM and a 512 gigabyte SSD is priced at $450. If you'd rather bring your own RAM and storage though, you can snag it for just under $400. I'll talk a little bit more about the value proposition later, but for now, let's see how well this thing performs. To start, I just powered it on. <laughs> to start, I just powered it on, spam delete, and found myself in the BIOS. And here, there are a lot of settings available to the user, everything from fan adjustments to even some overclocking, although not sure how useful that would be. Still, I like that these options are left available to the end user. I mentioned earlier that AUSTAR doesn't have any sort of NAS software of its own, so instead this just comes pre-installed with Windows 11. Now I have no issues with AUSTAR and I have no specific reasons to not trust them, but that doesn't necessarily mean I trust their entire supply chain. Considering some of the recent malware issues with other mini PC brands like Ace Magician or Ace Magic or whatever they're called, I just think it's smart to play it safe and do a fresh install. Now, obviously, Windows is not the best operating system for a NAS, but I wanted to see how that Ryzen CPU performed when running Cinebench R23. For comparison, I grabbed the results from a cheap mini PC with the Intel N100, the Mini's Forum MS01 with the Intel 13900H, as... Hi, Ruth. Come here. You want to be in the video? You can do this part with me. You ready? Okay, you ready? We're going to go back to Cinebench. The Mini's Forum MS01 with the Intel 13900H, as well as a similar NAS, the Ugreen DXP4800 Plus, with an Intel Pentium Gold 8505. When looking at the single-threaded results, the 5825U is substantially faster than the N100, but falls just a bit behind the Pentium and the Ugreen NAS. However, when switching to the multi-threaded results, the Ryzen chip absolutely smashes both. Although, here something like the i9-13900H clearly shows its multi-threaded dominance. That is, until you start looking at system power draw. When just at idle in Windows, the WTR Pro was basically tied with the little N100 mini PC, only drawing 7 watts, and was substantially more efficient than the MS01, and especially the Ugreen NAS. When running the Cinebench multi-threaded benchmark, you can see that the WTR Pro managed to draw less power than the Ugreen NAS while having more than double the performance. And while the MS01 took a massive lead in the benchmark, it also did so while drawing more than double the system power of the AUSTAR system. What do you think, Ruth? Any thoughts? No? Okay. So with this little AMD chip, the WTR Pro seems to be extremely capable and well-rounded. And I don't know if it's just because of the AMD CPU, or if AUSTAR did some optimization with this design, but it's pretty impressive that it only drew 7 watts at idle. For some comparison, both the Ugreen NAS I just mentioned, as well as the Zima Cube Pro, which I've also recently covered, would both idle at around 22 or 23 watts with no drives or anything. So in terms of efficiency, it seems like the AUSTAR system has a leg up here. 
Now one thing I was concerned about were CPU temps. However, when running Cinebench, I never saw CPU temperatures get above 70 degrees or so. While I still had Windows installed, I was able to throw in a few adapters and confirm in hardware info that both of the M.2 sockets were running PCIe Gen 3x4 and the M.2 E key socket was capable of PCIe Gen 3x1. Now Windows wouldn't be the worst operating system to use for an ASS like this, as I showed in the R1 video, but I think with the amount of horsepower this thing has, something like Proxmox would make a lot more sense. For that though, I wanted to try out something a little bit different. I don't see any reason why you would want a Wi-Fi adapter in this system, and that M.2 E key slot supports PCIe. So I swapped it out with this little adapter so that I could hook up a 2230 NVMe SSD. There was a bit of a clearance issue with one of the RAM slots, but it went down far enough. With this setup, I could use the little SSD as the boot drive and have the other two SSDs just for running VMs, caching, or whatever else. And yeah, it would be a little bit slower at just PCIe by one, but the 800 megabytes per second or so you get from that is still better than a SATA SSD. In the BIOS, whatever OS was previously installed on the SSD was recognized, so it seemed good to go. I installed Proxmox, and then after running the PowerTop autotune function and setting the CPU scaling governor to power save, the total system power consumption went down to just 5 watts. I set up the other two SSDs in a ZFS mirror, and then used that storage to start installing some containers and VMs, starting with Jellyfin. Now, AMD isn't as well known for hardware accelerated transcoding as Intel or NVIDIA, and I wanted to see if this little Ryzen 7 chip had anything to say about that. I set up Jellyfin in an LXC container, and after just a bit of troubleshooting, I got transcoding working using the VA API. It worked, but not extremely well. Now, I recently did a low profile home server GPU shootout thing, where I also included the results from an iGPU on a much older 8th gen Intel CPU. For some comparison, I brought those results over, and here, when looking at the FPS results from FFmpeg for a few different streams, you can really see just how much worse the performance was for the Radeon graphics. Now, I didn't do any detailed quality comparisons or anything, but I did notice some weird artifacting with this Ryzen system that I never noticed with any Intel or Nvidia hardware. However, it only really seemed to happen right at the beginning of a transcode, so it didn't seem like that big of an issue. Overall, it wasn't bad, but it might start to be an issue if you're trying to do multiple streams at once or something. Back in Proxmox, I also wanted to see if PCIe pass-through worked, specifically with the SATA controllers. Sure enough, I had no issues passing both of them through to a TrueNAS VM. For storage, I added in four 4TB 5400 RPM Western Digital drives, and I should talk about one other little nitpick I have here with the drive caddies. They do have holes for two screws to keep the drive in place, but primarily these rely on these little clips. The clips are tapered, so the drives can just slide in like that, which is nice, but getting them out is not so nice because, well, there's no mechanism or anything, so you kind of just have to manhandle them a little bit. So yeah, it's a bit of a nitpick, but it's definitely less than ideal. Oh yeah, and I also confirmed the website's not lying, these definitely are not hot swappable. With the drives added and some configuration, my TrueNAS VM worked just as I expected and I got pretty much perfect performance over a two and a half gigabit connection, which should be expected with four modern SATA hard drives. I also tested out a bare metal TrueNAS installation and got basically identical performance. Regardless of whether I was in Proxmox or bare metal TrueNAS scale, I was seeing about 23 watts at idle with all four drives and the three SSDs. And whenever I was writing to the NAS, it would only jump up to around 45 watts. That's actually really good, especially considering those other two NAS devices I mentioned earlier, the Zima Cube Pro and the Ugreen DXP4800 Plus. Both of those systems drew pretty much the same amount of power at idle with no drives as the AUSTAR system when it had all four drives and the two extra SSDs. Oh yeah, speaking of power, one last thing I did check out was the full function USB-C port. I figured this might have just been a copy-paste or language barrier situation, but sure enough, with a 100 watt USB-C adapter, I turned it on and it ran just fine. For even more fun and to see if I could take this NAS off of the grid, I grabbed a portable power bank and... I can't believe that worked. Oh wait. All right, no, it's not working. It's not working. Shut it off. Turn it off. <laughs> that, was, that was a terrible idea. Okay, so maybe a battery bank isn't a good idea, but you technically can still run this off of a powerful enough USB-C adapter if you wanted to, for some reason. But don't. For a simple little all-in-one home server, this is pretty darn impressive. 
It sips power, has CPU potential for just about anything you might want to throw at it, and it's all tucked into a nice little package. That being said, there are some letdowns. First of all, I really wish they would have found a way to make the drive base hot swappable. For most home users, 100% uptime isn't probably something you really care that much about, but that being said, it is still nice to be able to quickly swap some drives without disrupting services that, well, you're probably going to be running on this thing. It appears that they're using the embedded AMD SATA controllers rather than an Asmedia chip or something, so maybe that was just a trade-off they're aware of in order to keep costs down. Keeping costs down might have also been why they didn't include 10 gig, but I also don't know if that would even be possible with the 5825U at least not without removing one of the NVMe slots or cutting one or both down to just two lanes. That being said, I might've actually preferred to have two Gen 3 by two slots if it meant this also had a 10 gig NIC because 10 gig would really add a lot of value to this thing, especially considering there isn't a way to add any more networking through a PCIe slot or anything. Well, at least not without getting a bit hacky. The hardware accelerated transcoding was also a bit of a disappointment. It's maybe not too bad for just a single stream, but if you plan on having multiple family members or friends also streaming, AMD just might not be the right choice here. That being said, there is a cheaper Intel N100 version of the system. Obviously, as we saw earlier, the N100 will have less performance and you also get one less NVMe socket. But if you mostly just need the four drive bays, two and a half gig networking, and good transcoding, that might be worth looking at, especially considering it's about $100 cheaper. But if you don't mind the lack of 10 gig hot swap drives or great hardware accelerated transcoding, for substantially less than $500, it seems like this is a pretty darn good deal. Especially considering you're not really paying a massive premium over other bog standard mini PCs with similar CPUs. I really like what AUSTAR has been doing, focusing on some unique systems at good prices with no crappy proprietary software. Now, I know a lot of you are probably more interested in building something yourself, but I think there's still a solid market for a system like this. It strikes a nice balance between a full DIY build and the more locked in ecosystems like Synology. I have a buddy who isn't super techie, at least not with like building computers and stuff, but he's not dumb or anything. He actually runs his own Plex server off of his old Mac mini. And I could see this, or probably the N100 version, being right up his alley for an upgrade. He could throw something like Unraid on it, add drives as he needs to expand his library, and then easily upgrade to two and a half gig networking whenever he wants. Plus it's super compact, efficient, quiet, and not too bad on the eyes. What do you think though? Is this something you would consider? What would you like to see AUSTAR do in the future? Let me know down in the comments. Also, if you're interested in this system or some of the other stuff I talked about in this video, I'll make sure to have links down in the description. And hey, while you're down there, maybe hit the like button, maybe sign up as a raid member for early access and ad-free content, as well as some behind the scenes and bonus videos. I don't know, maybe. And that's about it for this one though. So as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay curious and I can't wait to see you in the next one.